you know the, the real plank that might be uh, 15 times as big is going to bend around also pretty easily. Yes, question. Does that mean he always worked to the outside of the frame, to the inside of the plank, when he did his walk finish? Well, I'll explain that in a little bit. I want to explain to you uh, one of the most fascinating parts of this process is how he measured from the uh, model the uh, dimensions. But uh, to answer your question, he worked with the outside of the finished hull, but the um, shop would have to subtract for the thickness of the planking, and also they'd have to subtract for the um, uh, half breadth of the frames, which in some cases, like in the S boats, were tapered. But all that was um, taken care of in the shop so that the final job came out uh, just as the model had been designed. And then uh, in the latter stages, we use uh, little planes. Uh, these are Stanley planes, little tiny ones. And uh, apparently, you used to be able to buy these for five cents. And uh, up in the model room, we've got a whole lot of them, which Captain Nat shaped with different uh, curves this way, which you could use particularly in planing the uh, modest curves of the deck. And then he has a lot that is shaped uh, with a roundness this way, which could be worked into these hollow points. And the beauty of these planes is that because they're shaped when selected to match pretty well the curvature of the hull, you see they in themselves are another important element in the fairing of it because if there's a high point, the blade will take the high point off. And if there's a low point, the blade will miss that, and as you plane it, you get closer and closer to the fair surface. So um, in this process, when you make models, never, never, never use sandpaper until you're all through carving, because the most essential thing is all these tools have to be razor sharp. And of course, Captain Nat would sharpen his own tools and if you would make the mistake of trying to help yourself along with a little sanding along the way, the silica, the grit from the sandpaper would quickly dull your tools. So no sandpaper until the model is essentially done. And then I'll show you a couple of pictures of how we use the sandpaper. You always use it with a block. And the block can either be a rather thin piece of wood like this one, or oftentimes, it's hard rubber, which you can, with your fingers, uh, direct into a, a small curvature matching the hull. And you'll notice in these models upstairs that there's never any rounding at the deck edge. The shape comes up to a perfect sharp edge. And if you're looking at models anywhere in Lannan's shop in Boston or any place else, the first thing in judging the uh, quality of the model is to look at the corners, the uh, way in which the top sides come up to the deck, the way in which the um, shape goes into the stem, and uh, certainly the way the, the keel is. And uh, you can quickly look at those and you can tell whether the model maker knew what he was doing or not. So the sanding is done with uh, various uh, grades of sandpaper down to very fine. And then uh, at the very end, uh, Captain Nett would shellac the models. Now, we didn't just buy the shellac in a hardware store. He actually used crystals, which he dissolved in alcohol. And the advantage of that is that uh, fresh shellac will dry quickly. And he would be able to apply uh, multiple coats over a short period of time. And in the 100 years since, we've done nothing more. Shellac has the virtue of sealing the wood, and it doesn't get too shiny and doesn't uh, flake off. And the important thing is to don't touch those models. So if we can preserve them from any disaster, there's no reason why they wouldn't last a few more hundred years from this time on. Well, now I'm going to show you, uh, if the lights can go down a little bit again, a little bit of how we use these tools. Here I'm uh, using the drawing knife. And you can see what a great tool that is because uh, it has a little width to it, and in a sense, that also helps the fairness as you pull it towards you, and it allows you to cut very quickly. So it's a good way to start out. 
And then uh, this is using the block planes to um, uh, go to the next step of uh, getting off material pretty quickly, but without getting into the final details. And then uh, we go to the chisels, and you can see this is a case of a small model where um, the chisel has quite a round to it, so I can work in those uh, inner corners there uh, with a curvature on the tool that rather matches the curvature in the model. And here, the employment of the batten, which has been chalked, and you wrap that around, and you see it fits pretty well, that particular hull, and then you scrape it um, uh, away and toward you around the uh, surface of the hull to allow the chalk to show you the high spots to be cut away. And again, uh, back with the chisel. And uh, here is that process that I alluded to before, is that even with Captain Nat's great judgment, nobody can judge just by looking at it exactly what the displacement or the weight of the uh, displaced water is going to be, nor can you quite uh, estimate where the center of uh, gravity or center of buoyancy should be to match the center of gravity. So what he did was he put the unfinished model on a um, uh, fair flat steel surface, uh, this table here, and then he had a pantograph. And so he could scrape that along the various sections and the pantograph pen up here would draw the shape of the sections. And he might do that for um, uh, 11 locations, really nine, because the end locations at the very bow and the very stern have almost zero volume underwater. So then he would use a planimeter, which is a uh, draftsman's device, to run around the um, uh, shape of the section, which would be a center line and the curvature of the immersed hull and then the water line. And the perimeter gives you the area of the section. And then having done that on all of these nine intermediate sections, uh, he could with a very simple mathematical formula, which is called the trapezoidal rule or Simpson's rule, he could calculate what would be the uh, volume of the hull and where the center of buoyancy would be. And of course, that's all done at model scale, but uh, Whatever you do at model scale can be enlarged to the full scale. And then he would go back to the modeling and maybe do this a couple of times, particularly if it was a very important boat like America's Cup Defender. And uh, then you go back to working on the model some more and uh, always using this batten. Don't, at the latter stages, don't do any cutting unless the batten is employed to show you the high spots. And that's one of the little five cent planes that I mentioned uh, being used to complete the forward end of this small model batten. And finally, after the uh, complete shaping is done with the tools, the sandpaper, and you see, I'm, if you look very carefully, and I think the next slide maybe shows it better, see that's a piece of fine sandpaper wrapped around a hard rubber block, which is rigid but is enabled to be slightly bent. And you can see that I'm guiding it with my um, small fingers along the rail, and I'm doing it in such a way that there's no possibility of uh, inadvertently rounding that corner so that the uh, edge is kept crisp as it would have to be on the full-size boat. And then after that, uh, slacking the hull, which uh, was very simple to do. Nothing like shellac uh, compared to paint to put on. It's just great because it doesn't sag, it spreads out, it is absorbed, and uh, it evaporates quickly, the alcohol, and it evaporates. Well, now the next part, which is an answer somewhat to the gentleman's question, is perhaps the most interesting part of this. Captain Nat wanted to design his boats by making models. And that was not at that time in the late 1800s the vogue for designers, but it had been the method in the earlier years and people uh, building ships and all would make models and they had an awful time to 
read from the model the shape of them. And uh, sometimes they'd even carve up a model like a loaf of bread and then lay the uh, pieces of bread, so to speak, down on a piece of paper and trace around them, and that gave them the shape of the boat. And they sometimes made models with uh, layers uh, separated by different water lines with a peg to keep them aligned and make the model and then afterwards take it apart. But in typical fashion, when presented with a problem, Captain Nat solved it. And he designed this special apparatus, we call it the offset machine, and um, had the famous um, instrument makers, Brown and Sharp, construct it for him. And it's comprised of um, a steel table, which is upstairs, and a track, which is very accurate coming along. And uh, this piece of wood in here is a batten to which you mark every location of a frame in the finished boat. And there's a pointer on the uh, moving apparatus, the offset machine, where you can uh, align that perfectly with one of these frame positions. And then uh, this uh, bronze piece is able to move up and down, and uh, this uh, steel uh, arm, which is very rigid, is able to move in and out. And so you then proceed around the hull, uh, intersecting the surface, and reading from these two gauges what's going on. This gauge here gives you the distance off center, the offset, and this gauge here gives you the height of a point. Now, it was very interesting. Uh, I made a visit to uh, New Zealand one time, and there was a gentleman there building a boat from uh, Harrisoff uh, uh, offsets. But when we say offsets, we mean the combination of heights and offsets, distance off center of one point on the boat, which corresponds to the intersection here. Uh, 